Howdy again everyone, and the title of today's video speaks for itself. Here is the Canon EOS R5, perhaps the most important camera that Canon have marketed in years. I pre-ordered it with Park Cameras here in the UK, and it arrived with me about 5 weeks ago. I'm a little late to the party in the recent YouTube gold rush to publish videos about this camera, but I wanted to give it a good month of testing or so before I went on record to say anything about it. I'd like to say, once again, a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters, your generosity really helps me to invest back into this channel to keep reviewing camera lenses at the highest levels for all you lovely people. If you regularly watch these videos and find them helpful, then please do consider joining in to support the channel. Now, I was reluctant to spend such a huge amount of money on this camera, but it's the only way I could test Canon's new RF lenses on a 45 megapixel sensor, which I really wanted to do to bring those reviews more in line with my Sony and Nikon lens reviews. And also, during the lockdown, I'm doing a lot more video work than I did before, shooting with people and helping various churches get their services out and whatnot, so having the latest of Canon's amazing autofocus systems really appealed to me, as well as the opportunity to play with shooting in 8K and 4K at 120 frames per second. Well, I'll talk about the video side of things a little more in a minute. Now, how should you really think of the Canon EOS R5? Well, something I will say from the outset is that this camera is absolutely spectacular in all kinds of ways, head and shoulders the best camera I have ever handled, with a few small disappointments of course, but I'll echo what one or two others have already stated in their own reviews, most notably Gerald Undone, that Canon marketed the camera wrong, really wrong. They built up an incredible amount of hype for it by focusing all the attention on its 8K video specification, or at least allowing that to happen, which ended up arising more interest among videographers than still shooters, which then only turned into disappointment and mild controversy when it was originally discovered that you couldn't shoot more than 20 minutes at 8K without it overheating anyway. I know that hindsight is 2020, and I don't want to sound too full of myself, but what Canon really should have done is to focus on the R5's clear position as the mirrorless successor to the 5D series of cameras, and left the 8K functionality as an added extra, because really, that's what this camera is, the first mirrorless camera in the spirit of the 5D series, if not even better, because this thing is actually quite a step up from even the 5D Mark IV in many ways. Well, let's briefly look at the camera's build quality and special features before we get into image quality. The camera's build quality is exceptional, as you'd expect, and up to the usual standard of the 5D series. Roger from Lens Rentals did a teardown of the camera recently and found that it was very well weather sealed. If you're coming from shooting with an original EOS R, then you'll find the R5 noticeably bigger and heavier. It's really quite chunky for a mirrorless camera, and weighs 740 grams with the battery. It's almost as big and heavy as my old Canon 6D digital SLR, although you should bear in mind that that in itself was one of the smallest digital SLRs on the market, so overall, the R5 is far more manageable than a 5D series digital SLR ever was, which were always pretty big. One minor bone of contention is Canon's choice of a Type-D micro HDMI connector for video output, which won't be terribly dependable if you're recording footage externally. Apparently, it's part of the camera's main board, so you don't want to damage it. What's very nice to see is the camera coming with Canon's brand new LP-E6NH battery. I tested it, and it really does offer about 15% more life than Canon's previous LP-E6N battery, and the newer type is identifiable with a handy little hologram on the front. The camera is very fast to respond to just about anything you're doing with it. It has Canon's latest Digic X processor inside it, the same one used for the latest 1D series camera, so it really is lightning fast to navigate menus and play back those 45 megapixel images and video footage. 
Gone as the multi-function bar of the original ESR, banished forever, hopefully, no one will miss it, and even I ended up joining the 99% of users who just disabled it completely in the end. It's replaced by a more traditional autofocus point selector, which is obviously useful in all kinds of ways and a welcome addition, although it does need to be pressed quite heavily to be responsive. And you also get a traditional thumb wheel now, which is a very fast way to control your settings and navigate the menu system once you've practiced enough to get back into using it. Something else I'm delighted to see is the return of a depth of field preview button, incredibly useful and inexplicably missing on the original EOS R. The viewfinder, as you'd expect, is phenomenally detailed and smooth, even when set to the lower refresh rate to save on battery power, and the rear screen is incredibly detailed and comparatively seeable on bright sunny days. It's so much better than the screens on Sony cameras, in my experience. The camera accepts both SD cards and the incredible but highly expensive CF Express cards, and it's easy to switch between the two. Now this is a perfect combination, if you ask me, SD cards for their broad use and compatibility, and CF Express for the future. You'll need a CF Express card for shooting video in 4K 120p, and for shooting most forms of 8K video too. However, something neat that I discovered is that you can actually record 8K onto an SD card. It'll record 8K in IPB mode only, with or without Canon log, but not 8K all eye or RAW footage. It'll record 8K footage onto an SD card as slow as V30, although ideally you should use a V60 card, especially if you're shooting in log mode, just to be sure. That's really useful to know though, you don't need an expensive CF Express card to shoot 8K footage. And one last thing, when you're reviewing your pictures, simply hold down the rate button to record a voice memo about that particular picture, up to 30 seconds long, which is then saved as an audio file with the same name as the picture. Very simple, and a very useful feature for professional photographers in all kinds of situations. Ok, let's take a look at some of my favourite features of the R5, and some of the other neat features that make it such a great all round camera. Most obviously is the camera's in-body image stabilisation, finally on a Canon camera. It looks like they've been perfecting it for a long time before introducing it to the world. Well, let's start by fitting it with an unstabilised lens, this 50mm Sigma Art. Here's some video footage without stabilisation, and now with image stabilisation turned on. You get very good, smooth results, unless you move the camera around too quickly, in which case you'll see some jerkiness. In stills mode, the stabilisation really takes off though, and I got surprisingly impressive results. On the screen or the viewfinder, before you take the picture, you see a little wobbliness that will leave you in doubt. Doesn't look amazingly stable here, does it? but it's only when you finally press that shutter button down that the stabilisation kicks in properly, and you can get exposures of around a full second handheld at 50mm, which is an astonishing performance, making this an absolutely brilliant camera for landscape photography or shooting any dark scene. When you use a lens which already has stabilisation, then the camera's stabilisation teams up with it to give better results than ever. When shooting with a 24-105mm f4L kit lens, when shooting things at medium distances, up to about 6 or 7 meters, at 105mm, I was able to get sharp exposures of almost one second long, meaning the stabilisation systems were giving me about 6 tops of assistance. However, when focused on objects far away, I could, with some care, get reasonably sharp exposures that were about 2 seconds long even at 105mm, and that is approaching the 8 stops of assistance that Canon were advertising, well, when you're shooting a subject that's far away, and if you have steady hands. Again though, that is brilliant for landscape or nighttime photography if you're averse to using tripods, bravo Canon, and finally. 
Moving on, by head and shoulders, one of my favourite new features is the Animal Eye Detect Autofocus that works with pretty much any animal, and very, very accurately. Go to your local wildlife park or just poke around your garden with any telephoto autofocus lens and you'll get perfect images every time, and that is so important and useful, especially for tracking birds in flight and even with third-party lenses. It sometimes takes a little persuasion to find the animal in your picture, but when it does, it focuses on the animal's eye really accurately. Oh, and the human eye detection is spectacular too. A little improvement in accuracy over the original EOS R, and a major improvement on how far away it can detect your human subject's face. I think there's no other camera as reliable as this one for getting eye autofocus bang on in your video work than the R5. And when shooting video, your customizability options for changing autofocus speed and tenacity are incredibly useful too, particularly used with one of Canon's newer STM or Nano USM lenses. You can slow down that focus racking speed to make it look really professional. However, in video mode, the camera is still a little prone to focus hunting if you turn it onto a subject that doesn't have any contrasting edges or definition to it. A couple of other autofocus options to note are the return of my beloved initial servo autofocus point for tracking feature, which you can see in action here. And touch and drag autofocus, letting you change your autofocus point with your finger on the screen while holding the viewfinder up to your eye. Although I found it helpful to keep it to the left side of your screen, otherwise you'll be continually changing autofocus point with your nose. Let's look at some of the camera's shooting modes. We get a built-in intervalometer for shooting time-lapse sequences, always fun and helpful. The now almost ubiquitous anti-flicker shooting mode is present too, being vitally important for sports photographers or event photographers shooting under artificial lighting. Something else I've noticed is that the camera seems to offer lens aberration corrections for electronic third-party lenses now, not just Canon lenses. I've only tried the camera with some Sigma lenses so far, but it's there, the in-camera corrections, and that's in stills or video mode, so absolutely brilliant, very gracious of Canon. Now, this camera can shoot very fast, 20 frames per second in fully electronic mode, which is seriously impressive for a 45 megapixel camera. If you're shooting RAW plus JPEG and using a very fast CFX press card, you'll get about 54 shots before your buffer runs out and the shooting speed greatly reduces. Shooting just RAW, that turns into about 80 shots, and just JPEG, about 150 shots. If you're using a fast SD card, a V60 in my tests, then you'll get about two-thirds of those buffer levels before the shooting speeds start to slow down. That's with the electronic shutter. If you shoot with a mechanical shutter instead, you can get about 12 frames per second out of the camera. Again, really impressive. However, that's only if you're using the newer LPE6NH battery, the bigger and more expensive one, with a good level of charge. If you're using one of Canon's older LPE6 batteries, or one that's half depleted, then this maximum mechanical shutter speed reduces to about 7 frames per second in my tests. Still, not bad. This camera gives you three clearly demarked shooting modes to use. Silent, or fully electronic shooting, that's extremely useful, of course, and it's also the fastest shooting mode. As usual, watch out for banding under artificial light. Although motion warping doesn't seem to be as bad as on other cameras I've tested before, the R5 seems to have quite a fast sensor readout. Next is first curtain electronic shutter, which is your standard shooting mode, which gets rid of those fully electronic shutter problems, but leaves you with a quiet clicking sound, a bit quieter than other cameras I've tested. And here's the fully mechanical shutter mode. You get a slightly different double clicking sound, but it's still quite nice and quiet. Use this fully mechanical shooting mode for the best possible quality bokeh in your images, if that's something you're aiming for. I should say here that I actually identified a problem in fully mechanical shooting mode. 
with a shutter speed of about one hundredth of a second, you see just a little vertical blurring in your images, even with firmware version 1.1.1, which just came out last week. I spoke to Canon Professional Services, and they have identified it as a problem with the image stabilization system, and it should be rectified eventually in firmware. Now, let's move on and look at still image and video quality. I want to start by talking about still picture quality, because that really is this camera's turned out feature, and Canon should have made a much bigger deal of it. The 45 megapixel sensor produces images packed with detail, despite being fitted with an anti-aliasing filter to reduce moiré patterning, so you kind of get the best of both worlds here. The colours are still addictively good as ever, although I might be a little biased, because I've worked with Canon cameras for years now and really gotten used to them. I did find myself dialing back on the reds a little though, in the white balance settings. I was particularly pleased with the high ISO noise level on this camera, as it doesn't seem any worse than the original EOS R, with its much lower resolution 30 megapixel sensor. Here's ISO 100 to 800. As you can see, 100 and 200 capture perfect detail, with 400 and 800 barely behind at all. We'll keep ISO 100 on for reference, and show you up to 6400. To my mind, 1600 and 3200 are both great. It's only at 6400 that fine details are getting lost, and darker areas looking a bit noisier. 12,800 is just about usable, but 25,600, and particularly 51,200, get really mushy. Still, for a 45 megapixel sensor, that's an admirable performance. Pictures taken at ISO 3200 will particularly surprise you, I think. Let's look at dynamic range. I've brought the highlights way down in these images, and I can see an improvement over the original EOS R, I think but it's still not as good as my Nikon Z7 camera, and shooting in high light tone priority seems to only make a small difference, so that's a little disappointing. Now, let's look at video quality. On the top left we have 8K, bottom left, the R5's high quality 4K mode, which takes a sample area from 8K footage, top right we have the camera's standard 4K mode, and bottom right, my old Sony a7R II, just to see how far image sensors have come in the past five years. You'll be able to draw your own conclusions here pretty easily. 8K is capturing a huge amount of detail, the 4K high quality footage also looks fantastic, although that's also prone to overheating in your camera as well. Standard 4K at the top right doesn't overheat your camera, but is very disappointing, really mushy. And finally, the 4K footage from the old Sony camera still looks quite sharp, but with a lot of aliasing going on that you don't see in Canon's high quality 4K mode. I hope that all made sense, and now for reference on the top right, here's some footage from the camera's 120p 4K high speed shooting mode, and on the bottom right now, 60p 4K. As you can see, those modes are pretty mushy too, although they're still capturing a lot more detail than 1080p high definition footage would. Well, let's have a look at a bit more footage while I address the elephant in the room. I want to tell you my experience of overheating with this camera, something everyone's been talking about. Basically, if you want to get long pieces of footage like shooting an entire concert or a wedding, or long interview, then this camera will do it for you, but only in its rather weak standard quality 4K mode, so other cameras would probably be more suited to you. However, if you're just getting video recording clips here and there, like a lot of video makers, or maybe just someone talking to camera for 15 or 20 minutes, then you have a lot of options. After the camera's firmware update 1.1, you can shoot in 8K for around 24 minutes before the camera shuts off due to overheating, which is actually not an unreasonable amount of time, although you'll want to turn it off again and keep it off as much as possible to help it cool down and give you a bit more recording time. Definitely leave the overheat control option on. I found that it completely restored itself after about an hour of being turned off. My favourite thing about the firmware update though, was that I found the camera became very good at shooting clips of 4K high quality footage, if you stopped and started shooting, by turning your camera off for a short time, over regular intervals. 
you could quite easily get a nice hour's worth of footage before any overheating problems come if you're stopping and starting. In fact, you could just keep on going if you give the camera plenty of rest. For my style of shooting, that is actually more than enough, and as you can see, the 4K high quality footage is absolutely stupendous in its sharpness. It really is the best 4K footage I've ever recorded. And just quickly, shall we look at some higher ISO levels now? Here's ISO 1600, where image quality is holding out well, and now 6400, where the Canon pulls ahead of the much older Sony camera. So the R5 is a pretty great choice for shooting in darker situations too. I've been shooting quite a lot of talking head footage in 8K video, and it enables me to get a shot as wide as this, and then crop in as far as this for close-ups. Quite astonishing really, it leaves you with incredible editing options. You need a sharp lens though to get the best out of the camera. Remember, 8K footage is the equivalent of about 33 megapixels of detail, so you really will notice lens softness here. My favourite lens so far to shoot 8K has definitely been my Sigma 50mm f1.4 art lens. It's more than up to the job, and the autofocus works really well, adapted onto the camera. Oh, and another feature, I love the option to change aperture in 8th stop increments on this camera. That is super useful if you're shooting someone on a partially cloudy day, or any other situation where you want to subtly change your exposure, it looks great. This only works with Canon lenses though, and in video mode. So, on the whole, when it comes to video, if shorter bursts of footage are within your style of shooting, the R5 will delight you with the quality of its footage and its amazing eye and face detection autofocus feature, which keeps your focus completely locked on your subject without any jitteriness, pretty much no matter what they do. If you need a video camera for shooting long takes and high quality though, then look elsewhere. If only the standard quality 4K footage was a little sharper. So there you go, that's my own whistle stop tour of the Canon EOS R5. Some of the features I haven't covered are the HDR shooting mode, HEIF format shooting, and the dual pixel raw shooting options, well, the camera is just packed with features frankly. All I will say though, is that those shooting features are more valuable than you might think, and will really help to future proof this camera, which is just as well considering what a financial investment it is. The Canon EOS R5 may not have been marketed perfectly, but I'm pretty confident that in 3 or 4 months time that'll all be water under the bridge, and people will come to realise further what an excellent camera it is, especially for stills work, it just does everything incredibly well. If you are regularly shooting long interviews or long events, or if you need the best available dynamic range, then other cameras can offer you a little more but none of those are major requirements for me, so the R5 leaves me completely delighted.